by just introducing each of our speakers. I'm going to have them actually say hi, and then we'll go back and dive in with them telling us a bit more about them. But but first, I'm looking on my full screen at the beautiful Judy Judith Dickinson from Colorado. So hi. <laughs> You can keep track of Judy, and I think uh, everyone's got their names on their pages as well, if you want to um, ask specific questions to specific artists. So we have Judy from Colorado. We have Robin Damore joining us from the beautiful Portland, Washington area. Uh, say hi. Hello. <laughs> and you're not really Portland. You are in? I'm in Vancouver. Vancouver, Washington. Yes. Yes, just across the bridge from Portland. All right, and then we have Kim Ballard joining us from uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Hi from Minneapolis. Yay, and she's spreading beauty and joy there for all the people. And then we have right here from Scottsdale, a few miles from where I sit today, Priscilla Nelson. Hi. All right, so as you can see, as they've been greeting you, they each have beautiful works of art behind them. And we're gonna talk about some of those great stories behind many of these pieces and um, they also I'm just going to say right off the bat that each one of these artists can do spectacular commissions for you and uh, Frank and Janice our friends Frank and Janice who are watching have had a number of commissions done of family members so that's exciting so um, okay so Let's go back and start with Judy up there in, uh, she's in, in a little cooler part of Colorado than normal in green, Greenwood, right? Evergreen. Evergreen. Green. It's somewhere green. Yeah. Unlike yes. <laughs> so Judy, can you share a little bit about yourself, like how long you've been painting and what it is that really captures you about uh, painting the figure in, sure. in particular? Yeah, I always, uh, I don't remember starting to draw. Uh, I tell the story that um, I learned to draw in church. My dad was the pastor and we thought he was pretty boring. <laughs> <laughs> so we were allowed to draw in church. So I, as a little tiny girl, would just draw everybody's face around me and probably distracted everybody. But when I was eight, um, a gentleman saw me uh, drawing so much and asked my folks if he could teach me how to oil paint and they agreed. And so I started painting when I was eight. We would stand outside by the lake and paint the, the landscape and all. And then I just couldn't stop. I just loved it so much. But I was always drawn uh, to faces and to people and figurative type of work. And I love to paint anything. It's a privilege to paint anything, but, but I'm always drawn back to that. And about um, 13 years ago, we decided to work in Africa. And so we decided that Judy would paint to support that. <laughs> so that launched my full-time uh, career into, you know, all of our income dependent on, on my art. And so I paint um, the African people and then I paint Western and then I do portrait commissions and figurative work. So that's sort of where I am now. That's fantastic, thank you. And, and I think we'll probably want to hear some more in a little while about your very recent experience you just had in South Dakota, but we'll, we'll save that for a little bit later. Okay. <laughs> so, all right, let's go on over to uh, Robin in, in uh, Washington State. Tell us, Robin, a little bit about your background and how you got into painting and why the figure? Well, um, I started painting uh, when I was 45. Um, I had a whole other life uh, before that, and um, I would say I've always been creative, but uh, um, uh, never thought I was good enough to actually call myself an artist. That seemed like something that only people like Judith could do. And uh, <laughs> uh, I um, uh, was in the Bahamas with my kids, and we were doing a drawing journal. We were drawing the you know, the shells and the, uh, the fish and stuff that uh, the sailboat didn't have a lot going on. And uh, one of my daughters uh, asked me if I would do a drawing of her. And uh, she actually sat for me for a couple of hours and it kind of looked like her. And I, I, I got excited uh, just about because it was so fun and so engaging. 
And um, I, I started drawing uh, a lot and um, I bought a book on drawing faces and I realized that I had a very bad process. And so I um, completely changed my approach to it. And the first person that I drew using a process where you would actually lay out the whole head actually looked like who I was trying to draw. And, wow. and so then I started drawing um, every day and uh, I drew for a couple of years and then wondered if I might be able to, I owned an advertising agency at the time. So I was uh, drawing in meetings and um, you know, uh, like every chance I got, I, I just was uh, sketching people around me. And um, I took a one week class from this Russian uh, in um, Seattle. Uh, he had flown in from New York to teach this class. And um, I had a complete meltdown in the middle of the week. And I thought, um, what am I even doing here? Everybody else, very experienced painters in the class. And um, uh, I really uh, thought I would leave even in the middle of the class um, and come home. And I called uh, home and I got my 10 year old son on the phone and he was very excited for me. And while well, you how's it going mom? And I said, uh, uh, not too good, I suck. Uh, and um, he said, uh, uh, I, I said, actually, I think I'm going to come home. And he said, you're, you're going to quit? And I said, yeah, that's what I've always taught you. <laughs> and, uh, so I, um, I ended up staying for the week. And uh, the Russian painter, who is, he is still a very good friend of mine and a teacher of mine, um, came to me the, the next day when I, when I came in. And he said, um, uh, I wasn't sure you were coming back. And I said, well, neither was I. And he said, uh, you just need to find your courage. And oh. I, uh, uh, that was the best thing that he could say to me. And, um, and I would say that, that, that painting and uh, becoming a full-time artist for me has been all about courage um, because I was stepping into something that I didn't, didn't know, didn't understand, and also something that I really didn't feel like I was good enough uh, to be included in that that category of artist. And um, uh, anyway, after that class, uh, the, the teacher called me from New York and he said, I can't believe you've never painted. You should come and study with me in New York. And uh, I had just sold a business uh, and my husband said, I will watch the kids. You have to do that. And uh, so I rented a little apartment in Soho and I went and painted with him uh, for not that long, um, less than a month. And uh, he, we went to the museums and galleries and we painted every day in this little apartment that I had rented. And after that, he said, you know, you, I can't believe I'm saying this, but you could start to do commissioned work. And so wow. I went back. Impressive. Uh, <laughs> I rented a studio, this was 20 years ago, and, um, and I uh, started painting. Um, I, I am also a, a photographer, um, so I combined those two, and um, uh, anyway, that's, that's how I got started. That's fantastic. I really want to focus on two things. Your son wouldn't let you quit because you, you had to be the example, and number two, it was all about courage. Yeah. Awesome. Good, good things to hang on to. Thank you so much. Okay, we're going to jump over to uh, Kim Ballard in Minneapolis. And Kim, you do such beautiful work that just it expresses joy and beauty and movement. And um, you also do some abstract pieces. I think each one of you do different subject matter. But your, your uh, figurative work has such an embodiment of, of joy and, and Share with us what inspires you. Um, I guess um, I started painting too when I was a child. Um, I kind of grew up with art. My mom was an artist. All of my memories of childhood involve art of some kind. I was always drawing and painting. That's just kind of what I did. My mom um, went to art shows and I was the child in the corner of her booth, um, you know, doing my own artwork and 
I, I see all the artists at the art show now and their kids are hanging out with them at the show. That was me when I was a kid. Um, she gave me a little table in the corner and I would paint rocks and sell them. And I know now <laughs> when I have a booth and every inch square inch is so precious, you know, for what I'm using it for, that how generous it was that she shared her space with me. That was, um, it, it hits home now. What a big deal that really, really was. Um, when I was in high school, I started getting my own booths at the art show. Um, and I've always done it ever since. In college, I made money, you know, spending money doing art shows and selling my artwork. Um, I, I didn't take any art classes. I actually had a business major. Um, I was a single parent and I felt like I needed to do something really practical um, so I could pay the bills. And um, I've always done art kind of as the, the background thing or the thing to make money in the meantime. Um, about 20 years ago, um, I, I worked in advertising for a while, but about 20 years ago, I was actually had the luxury to quit doing that full time and do art full time. And that's really when um, my, my life became what I really wanted to do. And I feel extremely lucky that I do what I really want to do. Um, because when I was working in advertising, I, like Robin said, I'd be sitting in a meeting, but I'd be drawing, you know, the people <laughs> or the trees in the corner. You know, everybody thought I was taking notes, but I wasn't. I was, I was, um, I was drawing. because that's where my mind really was in my heart. Um, when I'm painting... I'm fascinated with people. I've been, I've always been very detail oriented, but when I um, take on a subject, it's because of an emotional feeling. And my number one objective is to transfer that feeling that I feel inside onto the canvas and to show that to everyone and have them feel that. So when somebody looks at a painting and says, oh, I feel this, I'm just like, that's like huge, that was my accomplishment. That's what I was trying to get across was a feeling of some kind. And I, I feel that figures are able to express that um, like nothing else can. Um, body language, it says so much, whether um, a person's hand is up or open or you know down. I mean, each little gesture um, communicates so much visually and then I use my background, um, sometimes it's abstract or sometimes it's other um, objects or visuals. I do a lot of storms, a lot of birds. Um, they communicate whatever feeling um, or they, 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 it's an extension of what is getting started with the body language and the gesture of the figure. Um, and to me that that's a challenge. There's a concept involved in each painting. Um, where I put together that that message and that feeling and that emotion. That's fantastic. Yeah, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of that. Even the piece behind you looks very powerful. I have some examples, yeah, that I can talk about. Okay, good. So let's uh, circle back to, to uh, Scottsdale to Priscilla Nelson. Hear a little bit about how you got started. Well, proverbial, I mean, I was painting. There's uh, talk in the family always that at age two, I had the pencil and the paper and could spend hours. Um, you know, I, I've been painting for 40 plus years. I'm one of the lucky ones that have done it as a career. Um, I consider professional painting. I sold my first painting when I was 14. And needless to say, I was hooked. Now I always knew that artists would starve. So I actually went into uh, pre-med I was going to be a neurosurgeon and my dad and my, my mom and dad were extremely supportive every Christmas, every birthday. There was a new set of new uh, painting materials that I had never played with or experienced. Um, and my dad called me in and told me that I was making the worst mistake of my life. And I thought he'd lost it. You know, Mr. New York executive here, I'm in uh, pre-med uh, looking at med schools. And long story short, he told me, and I make all decisions in life based on this. He told me, you know, Priscilla, life is not a uh, dress rehearsal. And I looked at him and I'm like, what are you talking about? And he goes, you're not coming back to be an artist. He said, this is your one and only chance. And right there, I knew that that was the answer. So I'm self-taught um, with a caveat because none of us are self-taught. We always have found that 
artist or someone who inspired us to learn and be better. And I cannot say enough about my high school art teachers who were so dedicated and saw something in me and took those extra hours. And they both taught me a really strong base for drawing, for um, the basic pencil drawing, the strength, I think, of any piece of work. Um, that's great. Yeah, so that's I love every Every time we do this, we have people who bring up their high school art teachers. <laughs> So it's, you know, that was, that was the key and uh, figures because I'm self-taught and it was the most challenging. You know, I remember the first hand that I did, hand is one of the most difficult things to paint. The first hand I did looked like I had gotten silly putty and put those uh, sausages that come in a can. Oh. And I saved that in order to always look and see how far I've come. And it is courage. Um, anytime that we do a painting to put it out to the public, because we put so much of our soul into it. And then we are co constantly questioning our technique and, uh, you know, moving up to that next level. So it, it, Robin is absolutely correct. It, it takes a lot of uh, courage to, to paint and put it out there. Yes, yeah. that is absolutely true. Well, awesome. Um, so I want to move along to, because the time goes by so fast, um, each of you have some great stories or signature pieces that have really impacted your work. And I know we've already had a question. Um, I'm gonna let Beth maybe type it on the chat. Um, wait, I have it here. But um, so we're gonna go to Judy and have you answer this question. And then um, maybe Judy, if you can share, you know, obviously you have a passion for your, your trips to Africa and the family you built over there, and you just came back from South Dakota from a pretty impactful experience you do every year. You've got commission works. I mean, you have so many opportunities to share like super compelling things, but uh, the, the question from, from Pete is, is that one of Judith's earlier black and white portraits of a man and woman above your right shoulder. Uh. Above your right shoulder. There's no. Oh, okay. Tillac. That's no. <laughs> never mind. Skip that. I, I'm Thanks gonna say, a lot, Pete. <laughs> Judy. That's what I was like. What is he talking about? So Judy is not at her home studio. She's at a. She's at a beautiful gallery of hers in Evergreen, Colorado. If she was at her home studio, by the way, she'd be in a jail cell because yeah. that's where she paints. So. <laughs> <laughs> Cut it out. Okay, Judy, back to you. So what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter. Oh, just um, you have so many compelling stories. Um, and I'm looking, what I'm looking at above your right shoulder is a beautiful uh, Fiona. Oh, no, Terza. It's Paxton, what? Todd Paxson's daughter. Oh, yes. The sculpture. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I'm always thinking of ideas and I like a lot of variety. Um, and so the whole time, I mean, I love Todd Paxton's sculptures, but for several years, I had just that thought in my mind of having somebody with his sculpture. And so, cause I was gonna just paint one of his sculptures, but I thought how cool to have his daughter pose, which she did, she posed, uh, interacting with that sculpture and I just thought that would just be a fun one to do. I don't really, I, I probably should, but I don't think very often about the sale of something. I don't think, I wonder if this will sell or try to think what's best to market. I just paint what I want to paint and I paint a lot. So I feel like I have plenty of time to, <laughs> to paint things that I really want to paint. So, you know, if I feel like painting the Africans and I'm just touched by one of the uh, photographs we took over there, then I'll paint that. And as you said, we just did this photo shoot in South Dakota and it's just an experience. There are just people there and uh, horses and longhorns and, um, Angus cows and from early morning to late afternoon 
you're thinking about, you know, what you want to put together. So I'll come with just stacks of ideas and folders. And then I'm thinking the whole time, okay, I have to do this old cowboy and I'm going to position him with this little girl and you know things like that so the whole time i'm thinking of something and and just feel so privileged to get to paint so many different topics and and then in between is commissions and those are so important and i'm working on a number of those now particularly when it's somebody who's passed away and the one i'm doing now i'm positioning this mother who passed away with two daughters and uh, it wasn't a, a photo that they have. I'm just taking it from different photos, which makes it very challenging, but it's going to be a special thing. And then they want me to paint the same painting three times. <laughs> so because each daughter is going to get an original mm -hmm. and the, the husband is going to get an original. So that's what I'm working on right now. Wow, that's wonderful. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, we might come back to another story or two. I also would love each of our panelists to be thinking about maybe a tip to share because, you know, some of our viewers are artists or, uh, you know, learning just like you guys did. And, you know, what would be a great tip to share on like skin tone or painting hands? I remember when we were at um, the Crystal Bridges Museum in Bentonville, Arkansas, we were looking at this stunning painting and one of the security guards came up to us and he said, you know where that term, it'll cost you an arm and a leg came from? And we said, no, and he said, back in the early days before photography, that portraiture was the only way that you could capture a family member. And um, the more you would see hands and body parts, the more it, it, it represented more affluent because uh, they were harder to paint. So you paid more for a painting that showed that. So think about maybe a tip you can share with our viewers on the next round. So um, Robin, I know you've had some stunning stories too about people you painted and I see behind you one, well actually two great examples, the one of the bird, but also the two portraits you have right now in two different, uh, moments of time behind you? Well, um, uh, the, these two paintings uh, back here, this one, I have just finished uh, this one in the last um, uh, few weeks. Um, and it's from a photo shoot that I did um, a couple years ago. Uh, it's Michelle Nichols, who was uh, Lieutenant Uhura from Star Trek. And, um, she is um, 84 in the painting, and she is beautiful. 80, she's 87 now, and um, she uh, is just going through a um, a difficult time right now. Um, in that uh, she's she has dementia, and um, uh, at any rate, they there is a feeling that there was some elder abuse that went on um, with her. And um, so they are using uh, these paintings as part of the GoFundMe um, to help um, with her legal fees and oh, to wow. help um, uh, to raise awareness for elder abuse in general. And um, uh, anyway, she uh, is a, uh, probably the most famous person that I've painted. She is um, uh, an amazing a person. Uh, for those of you who maybe were never Star Trek fans, you still know her face and um, uh, and maybe you know some of her stories. She was the first African-American on uh, television that um, was in a position of leadership. And she was... Um, uh, also the first woman uh, in, in, a, in a position of leadership where she was actually leading in the 60s. She was a, a black woman leading white men um, as part of uh, Star Trek. And um, uh, it was, a, it was a, uh, an amazing role for her to play and it meant a lot to the people of color who saw her. She, she was a, a role model for them. 
Um, but she, the racism was so um, prevalent uh, on the, at the studio, like they forced her to use a, a different entrance into the studio when they were shooting, that she decided she was gonna leave the show after the first season. And she went into Gene Roddenberry and said, you know, I, I, I'm gonna leave. And he said, take the weekend and think about it. And um, he gave her some tickets to an NAACP um, gala for that night. And uh, she went to the gala and they came to her and they said, hey, um, uh, a, there's a big fan of yours here that wants to, to meet you. And she's like, all right, you know, she was kind of surrounded by fans constantly. And it was Martin Luther King. And he said, um, uh, he said, you know, yours is the only show that Coretta and I let our three little girls stay up and watch. And, uh, and we're, you know, big fans. And um, she said, well, I'm glad that you, that you like the show, but uh, I'm, I'm leaving. And he said, oh, you, you can't leave. Not because of the people who love you, but because of the people who hate us. And, um, uh, and she, she ended up staying for the three seasons that the show ran. And then she was recruited by NASA to um, uh, help recruit diversity into the ranks of the astronauts. Oh, wow. Uh, and she was actually honored by Obama in the White House for her work with NASA. Um, so it, it was a real honor for me to be able to paint her and to be able to spend the time that I had spent with her um, in, uh, in, in uh, uh, doing, creating the resources and, uh, uh, you know, and unveiling these paintings to her. Um, it's, it's, it was a real, uh, an incredible opportunity in my life. And uh, she and I partnered together and did a limited edition uh, print of the, the one that's on the wall back here. Um, and she signed them and sold them on her website. And, and then um, we, we've sold them kind of over the, the course of the last uh, a couple of years or so. Um, so that was, that was very cool. And then this, this guy over here um, with the, uh, the eagle skeleton, uh, in the Louvre, he is a, um, a singer, and he is uh, uh, the lead singer for a group called Genesis Revisited, which is based on the, orig the original Genesis band from the 70s, and this is going to be the cover of his next uh, album. And he That's actually a cuts a, 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 a vinyl album and they, they're, it'll be printed on the cover of the, the album artwork, and then it'll also be etched into the, the vinyl of the, the uh, album, which is, you know, like... That yeah. is so cool. Yeah. Vinyl's making a comeback. That's right. That's right. So there's a Facebook question. I'm going to stay on you for this one, um, because it talks... The question is, how do you capture personality versus just a portrait? And I think, given that you've got two very different... Uh, personality traits exhibited um, with Michelle right behind you. I, I think that's a really, any one of you could answer that, but since we're on you, um, it's easy, it's not easy, but there's one, you can just paint a yeah. serious face, but how do you capture personality? Well, um, can, you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, all right. Uh, there's a mute button for some reason that just showed up in, my, in the corner of my screen, but, um, uh, the, um, I was a photographer uh, before I started painting. So um, I uh, still am a professional photographer. So I spend a lot of time with um, each subject, uh, photographing them and looking for that look that will, uh, that says that they're thinking about something. You know, I, I really, this, this painting of Michelle where she's laughing is very unusual. I don't ever paint big, big smiling uh, faces like that. It's just that she looks so beautiful in that, uh, in that image that I, I just had to paint it. Um, but for, you know, for the most part, what I'm looking for is for someone to give me the real essence of who they are and to capture that in, in a photograph. And I will, will photograph for 
uh, you know, until I get it. So sometimes we'll, we will shoot for, you know, a half a day uh, until the subject and I agree, okay, now, yes, this is this subject at their most beautiful, which is really what I'm always looking for is how can I capture this person? What is really beautiful about them? Either they have a, a vibrancy of life or they are serious or they are whatever. I'm always looking for that. And when someone sits for you, because I will work from life as well, um, they settle into their face. They can, they often lose their energy and uh and so i find that um when i really want to capture a an expression i i shoot till i get that expression and then i am very good at being able to capture that expression on canvas uh with a drawing and then um you know going through the process and i can show you uh i just pulled out this this is the the, this is the photograph that I took of Michelle for this painting. And I always uh, blow the photograph up to the size of the canvas. So you can see this is a 24 by 36, I'm looking for the best way to show it to you, 24 by 36 um, uh, photograph of her. Can you see it, Susan, or is it too? Uh, yeah, tilt it forward. Okay. There. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so here you see this is the the photograph. This is my process, by the way. A lot of people work from uh, with computer screens, and um, and I like to just blow the photograph up to the size of the canvas, and then work one to one uh, on the canvas. Uh, so, and then on the back of this, you can see this guy, and he's right, yeah, right up there, <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, behind. And so that that is that's my. Uh, that's my process and that's how I, 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 when you, when you have it big like that, you can really see what's happening with the face. You can see the muscle structure and, um, and that's how you, you, and, and then there's that extra special something that sometimes comes immediately and then other times can be very elusive uh, and you, you have to just keep painting until you recognize the person. Like you yeah. look at them and you go, ah, that's okay. There they are, uh, yeah. and and, uh, and that uh, is is that's the the magic or the mystery for me uh, in the process. It's um, sometimes the gods are with you, and, <laughs> <laughs> and just and just to keep that one interesting with Michelle, you added that gorgeous uh, wrap, which I would buy in a second if I had that. But so good, so good, so good. So. Let's, um, I want to move on over to Kim and then um, we're going to talk to Priscilla about underwater after that. But Kim, let's talk about your dynamic um, emotions that you capture in your pieces. Um, like Robin, again, you have to be a photographer, I think, to go out and capture the reference material that you want to work with. Um, so I do a lot of photography as well. Um, and I usually start with a model and I have a couple of concepts in mind. I wanna be able to give her um, some ideas of the kinds of things I'm looking for. Um, but then I let the model just kind of take off with it because what I'm looking for is something very candid and natural. I don't want it to be posed or staged. Um, the minute you say, you know, move your hand like this and put this like that, it doesn't look natural anymore. It looks very stiff. Um, so I, I want them to be actually moving while I'm taking their photos. I don't take any static photos. Um, I usually give them a, a prop of some kind to play with, whether it's a scarf or an apple, a bird cage, um, weeds, um, just something so that they have something. Um, the minute somebody sits there with nothing in their hands, they don't know what to do with them. And it automatically doesn't look natural. Um, if they sit down, the minute I tell them to move in a different way, it doesn't look natural. So I've, I've learned to just give them a nugget, a nugget of an idea, just a seed, and then let them go with it. And um, usually I'll tell them to walk away or twirl or um, whatever it is um, for the concept that we're working on. Um, and I will take probably seven or 800 photos during a, a photo shoot. 
And then after I get home, I sit down and look through all of the photos and I look for that visual concept that speaks to me. Um, and I, I never know what it's gonna be. Sometimes there's all these surprises, things that happen um, just through the course of our interaction with each other and, and them being themselves. Um, that's just wonderful. The lighting, um, there's so many things that have to come together. Um, and I, I try to have as much faith as possible that if that image speaks to me, that once we create it into a painting that it'll speak to other people too. Um, it's a very intuitive process. Sometimes I can't even define what it is that when I see something, I just get excited by it. And I, I want a painting to speak that way too. So that's, um, so then I start with the photo and I'll show you, um, I'm gonna use uh, the painting. I feel like the weather girl where you have to like learn how to point behind you and know what you're doing. <laughs> um, this is a photo that um, I used as the reference for, 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 okay, I have to learn how to hold it so it'll, so you can see it. I was practicing this at home and it worked way better. Um, this is actually a photo. That's perfect. And it had just a, a clear blue sky behind it. And um, my whole concept, I call her the wind maker. And um, the whole concept is that her sweeping of her dress is she's actually creating the wind. And um, I, so I wanted a sky behind her that had the feeling of wind. Um, so the next step was I took some uh, photos that I have of old paintings that I had done before that had kind of the colors and the movement and the shapes that I wanted, cut them into pieces and taped them back together to create um, the composition that I was looking for. Um, oh, wow. So then this, so this was kind of like step two. Um, and then you can see her dress was a dark color. Um, and I, I originally painted it in that way, actually. And it didn't have the feeling that I wanted. I wanted her to have that feeling of the wind. And it was too dark and heavy. So um, I put her into the light tones. And she actually became part of the clouds of the wind that way. And then I took it a step further, the little triangular shapes in, that were on the dress. Um, I actually had them start to fly, lift off the dress and fly into the wind. And her dress actually becomes the wind. Yeah. And this is a process that Gorgeous. I didn't have that whole idea put together at the beginning. But as I worked through the painting, all of those things came together um, as I worked it out. It, it's just something that happens through the process and your mind it's like almost problem solving, you know, no, I don't like the dark, the light works better. And then it was like, oh, wait, if it's blowing, it should just be dissolving into the wind. And so, and so it evolves as you're painting. Um, the other example I, I have, yeah. Um, the other example I have behind me, um, this was actually a photo. This is the photo reference for this. And the photo was actually taken um, by a photographer at the art show, John Linton. He was in um, New Orleans this uh, year after the art show. And he ran across this little girl. Her name is Chloe. I like to call her Queen Chloe. She could be Cleopatra. I was just taken by the essence of her. She just had so much beauty in her. Um, and I, I just felt like she was like Queen Cleopatra, you know, she looked like she had this wisdom and just calmness and just grace about her. And I wanted to feel that emotion. And you can tell when I embed her into the abstract, I use abstract pattern a lot to give the emotion or the shapes or the, the movement to, to accentuate it, to bring it to life. Um, I really feel that the abstract brings it to life. Um, mm. And you can see the difference between, um, ah, it's hard to get them both up there at the same time, um, <laughs> between just the static, just the static background and the background with, you know, life and color and emotion in it, um, how it complements and brings out the feelings of the person. And, and that's really what I'm shooting for when I'm creating a painting. So, so beautiful, Kim. Thank and I, I really think every figurative and portrait artist you have to be able to connect with your with your subject and whether it be through 
your experience of photographing them or just that instant connection you had with that photo that John took, you feel that and that's what makes these paintings just really come to life and so, so vivid and so real and capture that emotion. And you have such a beautiful palette to the way you choose those colors that you know contrast with each other. And I love how in the Queen Cleopatra, there's not necessarily a great difference in value between say the shirt and the hair in the background, but there's just enough that you see the, the edges. I purposely want them to become part of it at times. Um, and, and I find myself doing that quite a bit. I want them to be part of that pattern. And I then, um, the focal point or the energy or the things that you want people to, um, that, that you really want to pop out is where you um, allow the contrast to happen. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. It. And we're going to move over to Priscilla. And uh, definitely, Priscilla, you have a much more punch up uh, palette in most of your paintings, not all. Mm -hmm. But you sort of are known for incorporating water yes, as well as a beautiful female figure. Um, so I don't know, I'm looking at your self-portrait behind you. I'm looking at the underwater. <laughs> yeah. um, so let's just hear about what inspires you and, and you know, what makes you want to do the, the underwater scenes. And So, you know, I taught myself figurative and I fell in love with that. And there was something, I mean, I'll do portraits every once in a while. I'm more likely, like I just, the huge commission that I did is them in vacation and they're surrounded by water, the pool, the ocean. So the portraits that I get are more of moments. Um, and that's what I try to capture. You know, I'll tell this quick story because one, it'll tell you who I am as a person. I wish I could say that I paint water because of some aha moment. My daughter, who was 17 at the time, fully dressed, was leaning over a pool. I'm cooking dinner, saw her from the window in the kitchen. Knowing that if I opened the French door, she would hear me. I went through the front of the house, walked all around, uh, quietly took my shoes off and threw her, pushed her in the water. That's the kind of parent that I am. She was 17. <laughs> Don't ever do that to a 17 year. I think it took her about- She recovered yet? Like uh, She finally recovered. She has still not forgiven me that moment. <laughs> anyway, so when I pushed her into water and she was fully, she had on a summer dress, the movement. And that's what I love. I, I capture the feeling of the moment. Um, and so was that step. Now I am a swimmer. I love water. I've always been near the ocean or, and of course I moved to the desert. That made a whole lot of sense. Um, but so for a long time, I've tried to incorporate water into my paintings, but if you see the one where you see the back and she's holding an onyx, you know, that captures, it's figurative and it's someone, but it captures more of an emotion. Um, I prefer for the viewer to tell the story. Um, uh, we all see so many different things. Um, I've always been fascinated by how you get a group of people in the same moment, same time frame, and they all come away with a totally different perspective and meaning. Um, so with my paintings, I try to do that. Um, I, I use a lot of color and then I go through the more muted. Um, I only wear black. <laughs> my closet is all black. And one of the reasons, which is sort of weird, and I don't talk much about this, um, a lot of my paintings actually capture the music that I'm listening. Hmm. Um, I'm one of those people that has a tendency to see color with music and get that color and feeling involved. So my paintings, uh, whether colorful or more than muted tones, are actually somewhat dictated more by what I'm listening than the uh, image that I'm painting. I have a tendency to start with the figure and before you know it, I've changed the clothing, I've changed the background, I've changed the hair color because it's uh, how I feel, unless I'm doing a commission piece. Um, but yeah, so water became, ever since that moment, I just, I literally throw my models in the water. I'm in the water with them. Uh, those pieces I have to use a photograph as a reference, but usually it's like a five by seven photograph that I use as a reference because as I paint it, I add so much. So, and uh, you know, it's why it's it's. I don't know about the other artists, but my my art has always changed with a moment like that, 
whether, you know, something that inspired me or this, you know, practical joke that I can pull on my poor daughter, but that's how my art develops, so. That's great. Well, the, the way you capture that reflection in the, the it's like total realism, uh -huh. with the one right behind you with the yellow and the pink, and yeah, then the, so the so way the water reflection happens is just mesmerizing. So that's one of my favorite things to do. And I, you know, if you can see the painting that is really bright with the pink and yellow, you know, you know it's a figure. Um, and I'll get up real quick. So what dictates, what most important part of this painting, and it's a heavy piece, is right here. Because that's what's telling the brain that she's underwater. If I did not put that, everybody, the viewer's brain would not quite comprehend. But what I like about those paintings, that it's a series that I always have, always do two of those a year, sometimes three, is that as your eye travels, the realism disintegrates. And the water totally distorts, distorts everything. And half of that painting is not realism. It's total abstract. Right. And it took me a while to figure out how to get that abstract to marry the realism and be part of a cohesive painting. So that's probably my favorite thing to do is to capture that moment. So that's fantastic. Woo, thank you. Okay, so I put a challenge out earlier for you to each maybe think about a tip. Like, how do you paint hands? You want, you want to take that? So it's a quick, so it goes back to the way we see things. And when I have taught others, which I don't do often, how to paint, one of the biggest mistakes that most people do is, you know, you, you, you give a child a pen and a piece of paper and tell them to draw a face. And it's the universal almond shape, Cupid. We all have an image of what a human face should look at. Like, um, when I do someone's face i don't see eyes i don't see nose i don't see mouth i see planes of light and planes of shadow mm -hmm. and that's what i paint and if you paint that truly to what you're seeing it is amazing how all those lines and shadows become cohesive and form a face so to me as that's how i do it um i think the minute we try to draw a hand the minute we try to draw a face especially if you're starting you get overwhelmed. Instead, connect those lines and connect those shades. Pla planes of light and dark and lines. That's how I paint, so. Oh, that's a great tip. My mom, who's a painter, has been working on a, on a piece and she'll, I'm hoping she's watching to get that tip because she's, she's awesome. So, um, so Judy, do you have any tips on that? Either uh, skin tone or hands and feet? It's a little similar to what Priscilla just said, but for my students and what I think about when I uh, start a painting for sure is values and values are just the darks and the lights. So people get so hung up in color, whereas your values are gonna capture the likeness, your values are gonna create the realism. And then you could paint it the most absurd colors and it would still look like the person um, and so, you know, color is another issue and, and I love to see how many colors I can put in a face, but the more important issue is really those values. And that helps to simplify it in people's mind, you know, of just um, what are the lights and the darks and all the middle tones um, in your values. The other thing I would say, the most important thing that I try to communicate to students is what I can tell if it's going to be a good student, they can see when something's not right. That's more important thing to cultivate than, than really anything else. So many students I've seen, they're just satisfied with whatever they do and they think it looks wonderful. <laughs> but to start being able to be perceptive to what's not quite right and then don't give up, have the courage, as we were saying, to just keep working at it and you'll get it right. So uh, just always be checking what is not quite right. So values and that would be my two tips. Those are great tips, yeah. And you know, it takes time to develop any skill, so. For sure. Do lots of it, thank you. Uh, Robin or Kim, you wanna? I have something, I, I, I'm just a little visual aid here. 
Uh, so one of the things that my Russian painting teacher <laughs> was this old master's uh, technique, which is something that Rembrandt used, which is the idea of a grisaille. So a grisaille is a white and raw umber painting. Um, so, so just as Judith was saying about uh, being able to lay in values, uh, the, this idea of creating basically a value uh, painting, and then uh, once that is dry, uh, putting glazes over the top of that to create skin tone. So this is a this is a kind of the process here. Um, so uh, here is the the model, and uh, here is the drawing in charcoal on a on a a toned background. Here is white and raw umber. And I was just learning how to do this. So this was, you know, kind of my first drawing. This is my teacher's drawing over the top of it, where he came in and said, no, no, you have to, to put in much, much more um, dramatic contrast uh, in the lights and darks. Uh, this is the um, uh, glazing over the top and then the finished painting. And again, this is one of the very first paintings that I ever did. Uh, but uh, I like how you can see the process of grisaille. I, I teach grisaille in my workshops because um, it allows students um, to work on the drawing without having to worry about color because once you move into color, then it can get uh, more complicated and people often uh, will, you know, create mud in color and that kind of thing. So it allows you to, to just be able to work on the drawing, get the drawing correct, and then uh, and then move into color as a as a second step. So um, that's a that that's a process uh, that has helped me a lot. Uh, and I use that process um, or a combination of that process. It's called indirect painting. And then I will also paint directly where you're you see a color, you mix that, and that goes on onto the canvas. So it's a those two are are what I teach in a workshop where we do two paintings. We start with a grisaille and then, uh, you know, through the week, then we go to a um, more direct painting style to, so that you can learn about color um, as you go. Fantastic. Value, 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 then add color. Um, okay, so Kim, got a tip or two to share? Well, I agree with everything everybody else said. Those were really good tips. Um, something that people ask me a lot when I'm at the show, they'll, well, they'll say, oh, you have so much talent. That's why you can do this. And it's like, no, no, no. It's because you practice all day long, every, every single day. It's like what you spend really a lot of time working on is what you develop. Those are the skills that you develop. So I think practice is just like, practice, practice, practice. You, you don't just pick it up and start drawing because you were born with talent. Um, I think maybe what you're born with is um, an aptitude, something that makes you um, fascinated or you really love to do that. And that's what um, makes you spend all of that time practicing. Um, if you don't have interest in it um, or an aptitude maybe, um, then you, don't have the patience or the interest to spend all of that time practicing to develop the skills. I, I think that's really a lot of it. Um, the other thing people will come by and ask me, what color blue do you use? Or what kind of medium are you using? Or what kind of canvas are you using? Or, you know, they think there's a secret in all of these things. Um, or how did you make that look like that? And it's like, I tell them you can ask 10 different artists the same exact question and they'll give you 10 different answers <laughs> because they found what works for them. Um, and so it's like you have to explore, you know, get the materials and explore and see what they do and see what works for what you're trying to accomplish a little bit too. I think there's exploration and I think there's practice. That's great. You guys are awesome. Um, I'm writing notes. So each of these fabulous artists will be at the 2021 Celebration of Fine Art. And in the meantime, you can find them on our website and we can reach them for you or you can connect with them. Um, you're all painting a lot, I know, because you're not doing shows. 
right? While you're doing some shows. So um, do we have any other questions? There was one about, I, I would say a subject matter. Um, Priscilla, have you paint, like th this would be a subject matter question, but have you ever tried to paint a, a child jumping in the water being caught by a, a parent? Yeah, actually I've uh, had a commission that was that and uh, you know that one's got a lot of motion um, and it usually a lot of expression from from the parents so yeah I, I have uh, I had a while back one commission that was um, the hands out and the kit jumping and the splash and so th those there's a lot of emotion in that both on the parent and the child right that really is. yeah so those are a little bit uh, a little bit more time consuming you know any time that you catch you know, like this one here where she's laughing, you know, you have to actually tone it down. I know Robin would probably, you know, maybe really understand that because, you know, it's, it's such a strong facial expression that she had there. You know, her nose was really scrunched up and, you know, as I painted, I actually softened a little bit because it's almost too much information. Uh, for the viewer, but yeah, I have actually done the jumping in the water, the splash everywhere. Um, I don't know if you can see that one. I'll get up and uh, sort of similar. This is with a GoPro, and the swimmer was coming right at me. Oh, cool! And so you know, you see barely the face, and again, it's that motion that you create, and what you see is more water than anything. But you can tell that you know she's creating her own wave with her body, so it's called making waves. But yeah, are, so you, sure, are you sure that's not Pete Tillack under there? I'm, I'm sure it is. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who don't know him, we have to give him a hard time. So, um, again, thanks to those of you who want to connect with us, and we're happy to have you here. And. Uh, okay. On what says thank you from Alberta. Yay, watching from Alberta. So. Um, want to be respectful of our time. We've gone over a little bit, but again, thank you all so much for being here and we wish you lots of joy and until next time, keep celebrating art. Zoom on.